Hey everybody, today we are debating whether or not God exists and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here as we have Jonathan and McClatch Jonathan McClatchy and Tom Jump ready to square off in today's SummerSlam debate on God's existence. So this is going to be a lot of fun. We've got a good mix of statements as well as dialogue, namely cross-examination, my favorite part. And then just want to mention a couple of things up front. So quick, I have to explain it, really sorry. We were supposed to have, just earlier today, a couple hours ago, we were supposed to have the Kent Hovind debate with Mr. Archaeopteryx, in which Kent Hovind was basically going to debate whether or not evolution is a dangerous theory. And that, unfortunately, has been rain-checked. So if you really wanted to see that and you're like, hey, where'd that go? Well, we are hoping to have it sometime in August. So tune in for that. That'll be an exciting one to be sure. And also other house cleaning stuff. If this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we are trying to build an eclectic community of Christians, atheists, Republicans, Democrats, even libertarians. So we are thrilled to have you here. That's a joke, come on. So Jedi and even Sith, all are welcome here. And with that, one also mentioned we're very excited. Arn Ra and Dr. Seigart will be debating God and biology next Sunday. So that's one week from today. You'll want to check that out as well. Whew. Our speakers both have their links in the description. So if you enjoy what you hear today, I highly encourage you check out their links below because they are both very active in putting out content regularly. Uh, these guys are two of the harder working guys in terms of uh, putting out content in the apologetics, atheism, philosophy of religion world. And I am sure you will not be disappointed with their content. So with that, I want to just give you a brief synopsis of today's format and then we will jump right into it. So first, 10 minute opening statements from each speaker followed by... I thought it was, I, I thought it was 20. Oh, that's right. Forgive me about yeah. that. 20, you're right, thanks. It was 10 minute first rebuttals. So 20 minute opening statements, 10 minute first rebuttals. Then the second rebuttal will be five minutes, then 10 minutes each for cross-examination and five minute closing statements followed by Q&A. So I am going to make extra quick little house cleaning announcements between our statements, just so we don't have too much up front and I'm going to set the timer. We usually have the affirmative go first, but I will defer to the debaters. And so debaters, if you guys want to do it differently or the negation, uh, the negative goes first, that's okay with me. Otherwise, I assume it will be Jonathan and I will set the timer for 20 minutes. So usually, usually I suggest that the um, affirmative of the proposition goes first because it's their burden of proof and then the other side has to say why they disagree with their case. I like your thinking, Jonathan. We're on the same page. And last but not least, is everybody's audio okay? I just want to ask if in, in the live chat, if you can give us any feedback, just doing a quick audio test because I, I feel like it's, it might be my head. Maybe I should, they've been through the ring. Maybe I should say something then so people can make sure my audio is working. I'll say stuff. There you go. Testing, testing, testing. And, and then Jonathan, can you guys hear me? One, two, three, one, two, three. Everybody good? I'm watching the live chat. By the way, if you do not follow Tom on Twitter, he is at not underscore T jump. That is his account and you will be very pleased. Just kidding, that's a parody account. I love parody accounts, by the way. I honestly think they're funny. I haven't made any, please don't make any of me, but I do love watching them. So audio sounds good. Thanks, J.A. Green. Appreciate the feedback. Thanks so much, Hi Harry, as well. And everybody else, that you guys are awesome. We appreciate your guys' interaction. So with that, I will start the timer on your first word for your introduction, and thanks for being here, both of you. Well, thank you, uh, both of you. Thanks uh, to Jim for uh, moderating uh, this evening's debate, and thanks also to Tom Jump for um, agreeing to participate and discuss uh, with me this very important topic of, uh, of the evidence pertaining to the existence of God, a topic that's been debated uh, for centuries, even millennia and uh, is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. So without further ado, let me 
I just jumped straight in. I'm going to be presenting an argument. I've presented now in a few de debates, uh, and I've not, uh, to this point, come across a, a response, which I think is uh, to my satisfaction. So I'm going to be presenting this argument again. This is the moral arena evidence for the existence of God. Um, Slide. Okay, um, so let me just uh, def uh, start my argument by defining what I mean when I talk about a moral arena or a moral choice arena, if you will. Well, a moral arena is a community of persons in circumstances where they can engage in what we uh, often call uh, moral decision making. These are not necessarily humans, but there are persons in circumstances where they can engage in what we at least call moral decision making, where they interact and mold themselves in what gets called morally significant ways. Um, I want to introduce at this point what uh, what's known as Bayes' theorem, and, and this in particular, this equation that you see on the screen uh, represents what we, what's called the odds form of Bayes' theorem, which is used in developing cumulative cases. And translated, it basically states that the posterior probability of your hypothesis, H, given the available evidence, E, is equal to the prior probability that's given the background information of the hypothesis or the intrinsic plausibility of the hypothesis being true expresses a ratio multiplied by the ratio of the evidence given the hypothesis against the probability of the evidence given the antithesis. Uh, so dividing the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis by the probability of the evidence given the antithesis gives you what's referred to in probability theory as the Bayes factor, which is a measure of the strength of the evidence and indicates how many times more likely it is that you will observe this evidence, given your hypothesis is true, than if it were false. Uh, for instance, a base factor of 100 indicates that your evidence is 100 times more likely if your hypothesis is true than if it were false. Um, and uh, so that's um, so. This is uh, called the, um, as I mentioned, the prior probability that's highlighted with the red box on your screen. And uh, the first thing we need to do is establish what's the prior probability that God exists. Well, I, I just want to be generous uh, because it's, it's, it's a hard thing to estimate, I'll grant. So I think most of us would, would uh, grant that the prior probability is greater than 10 to the minus 20. So let's just use that value, 10 to the minus 20, as the prior probability of God. I think that's a very generous estimate uh, to the atheist. So I'm going to argue then that the moral arena is strong evidence for theism over atheism. Um, how do I define evidence as a Bayesian? Well, um, evidence, um, as, as I said, I'm going to argue that the, the probability of a moral arena given theism is greater than the probability of a moral arena given atheism, right? So just to give an illustration to help explain this, um, if you imagine you have a court scene and the guy's on trial and uh, the forensic scientist brings forth the, the murder weapon and let's say the handle of the murder weapon has the accused fingerprints on it, well, that would be evidence for the guilt hypothesis over the hypothesis of innocence. It doesn't prove the guilt hypothesis, but it's very strong evidence for the guilt hypothesis because the probability of the fingerprints being on the murder weapon is much greater than the probability of the fingerprints being on the murder weapon, given that he's innocent, that, that, that he's innocent. Um, and so, uh, therefore, it's, it's strong evidence for the guilt hypothesis over the innocence hypothesis. And I'm making a similar argument here when it comes to the existence of God. Um, so let's then talk about the moral arena, the probability of a moral arena, um, given uh, uh, um, theism. So what is the probability of the moral arena given uh, given uh, theism? So I'm uh, so I'm going to suggest that the probability of a moral arena is at least um, one percent, which I think is is an outrageously uh, generous assumption uh, to the atheist. I think that. Um, most of us would consider the probability is at least one percent, and why, why would um, why would a moral arena be something that you would expect to exist given the hypothesis of theism? Well, consider that an all good God is not unlikely to bring about great or, or the greatest goods, and whether in fiction or reality, the greatest goods require a community of embodied moral agents. And so I'm going to argue or suggest that the probability is at least 1%. It's not something absurdly low, but I, I would say that I think 1% is a very conservative estimate for the probability of, of a moral arena being uh, existing given the hypothesis of theism. What then, though, is the probability of a moral arena existing given atheism? Well, all I need to show is it's much less than the probability given theism. So um, 
we could so what's the probability then well we could just guess but our our estimate is likely to be more uh, realistic and reliable if we break our problem down into uh, its various uh, constituent subcomponents so what do you need for a moral arena such as i've described well you need of course first of all a universe governed by physical laws such as gravity um and of course this the, the evidence from science very strongly indicates our universe is um is temporally finite that is to say that it began to exist at a point in the finite past um, and so uh, um, we have to explain the origins of our universe um, and the physical laws that govern it such as gravity etc what's the probability on atheism of that happening well i'm just going to say for the purpose of argument that the probability is something less than 0.1 percent on atheism what but you don't just need any old universe you need um, specifically a life permitting universe. And it turns out, and physicists have shown, that our universe is um, balanced on a razor's edge for life of any form to exist anywhere, anytime in our universe. We don't just mean life as we know it, but specifically any form of, of life. Um, in fact, in this Nature uh, news article, Brumfield here confesses, and I quote, if you believe the equations, of the world's leading cosmologists, the probability of the universe would turn out this way, life permitting by chance, are infinitesimal. In fact, Luke Barnes, back in 2012, published a review, he's a natural physicist at University of Sydney in Australia. He published a review of the scientific literature surveying more than 200 papers. And he says that he can only think of, quote, a handful of physicists that oppose the conclusion of fine tuning and piles and piles that support it. Um, in fact, he lists uh, some of the widely recognized constants that require fine tuning for life. Uh, for example, the cosmological constant, which uh, determines how rapidly the universe expands, is thought to be finely tuned to one part in 10 raised to the 120th power. So in the denominator, you have after the one, 120 zeros. That's an extraordinary level of fine tuning. Uh, in fact, if you get it wrong, the universe either expands so rapidly that you only ever get the two lightest elements, hydrogen and helium, or it collapses within picoseconds of the Big Bang. And notice, in such circumstances, no life of any kind could exist. In fact, um, it, um, Roger Penrose has put forward an argument, uh, or put forward um, uh, uh, he, a mathematical um, calculation that, uh, concerning the initial low entropy conditions of our universe. And it turns out that, um, uh, so Roger Penrose is a, a physicist and mathematician at University of Oxford. It turns out that nearly all arrangements of particles in the early universe would have resulted in a, in a lifeless universe of black holes. Tiny inconsistencies in the particle arrangements would be acted on by gravity to grow in size, a positive feedback result since the clumps of particles have an even greater gravitational force on nearby particles. Penrose's analysis shows that in the incredibly dense early universe, most arrangements of particles would have resulted basically in nothing but black holes. And life, of course, certainly can't exist in such a universe. In fact, uh, Penrose calculates that the uh, probability of attaining uh, the initial low entropy conditions of our universe is finally tuned to one part in 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123rd power. So in the denominator, there's more zeros after the one than subatomic particles in the known universe. That's how fine tuned uh, our universe is. Let's look at a few other constants that require fine tuning. There's the cosmological constant I mentioned already, the expansion rate of the universe, the ratio of electrons to protons at uh, one part in 10 to the 37th power. If it's larger or smaller, chemical bonding would be insufficient for life chemistry. Uh, the um, ratio of electromagnetic force to gravity, um, the energy density of the universe, which if, lar if it was slightly larger, gravity would have uh, quickly slowed the expansion and then caused the universe to collapse too quickly for life to form. Or if it was smaller, uh, the universe would have expanded too quickly for the formation of, of galaxies, stars, and planets, etc. Um, but I just want to assume, for the purpose of our argument, because I, I just want to be uh, generous uh, to my opponent this evening, that the that the probability of attaining a life-permitting universe on atheism, on the hypothesis of atheism, is just something less than 0.1%. I don't think anyone can contest um, a value that generous uh, this evening. So. Once you've got uh, a life-permitting universe, what else do you need? Well, you need uh, the origins of life to occur. Um, so given that there's a life-permitting universe, how much would you expect that life would actually arise in it? Well, it turns out that, uh, that life is governed by the genetic code, which uh, is the language system uh, that the cell uses uh, to convert a messenger RNA into proteins. And it's made up, the uh, messenger RNA has three um, has, has um, 64 different words, which are called codons, which are made up of three letters, 
representing some chemical subunits, each of which codes for an amino acid. And there's a code onto amino acid mapping system that you see here on the screen. It's a language system. Uh, putting that together, um, uh, uh, putting that uh, genetic, assembling such a genetic code is, is a requisite for the origins of the first uh, life forms. How would, what, what are the odds on the hypothesis of chance and necessity that you would be able to put together uh, information systems? In fact, information in all of our experience traces its source back to an intelligent, rational, conscious agent. Um, I also, um, I also uh, and, um, necessary for the origins of life for the origins of the first proteins, um, which, uh, which are uh, w w the structures of which are determined by the sequential arrangement of their amino acid subunits. Um, and one question we can ask is the ratio of functional uh, protein sequences relative to the uh, um, of non-functional gibberish within uh, that combinatorial sequence space. So if you imagine, so we have 20 different amino acids uh, that make up proteins that we find in life. Um, that means that for a modest length protein of 150 amino acids, there's 20 raised to 150th power of possible combinations, which is a huge combinatorial space. It's, more ways of arranging the amino acids than there are subatomic particles in the known universe. So the question we can ask is how functional are protein folds in combinatorial space? How likely is it that by chance you'll be able to find um, those functional sequences? We know that many of these are, are functional and there are many of them that are not. So what's the ratio of functional to non-functional sequences? Well, I refer at this point to uh, the work of Dr. Douglas Axe of the Biologic Institute. Um, and uh, he basically conducted what's called a site-directed mutagenesis experiment on an enzyme complex called beta-lactamase, which is an enzyme that confers antibiotic resistance to some bacteria. And um, he basically calculates, um, we can get into the details if you want, but he calculates that the probability of the first proteins, uh, or, or, or the probability of a, of a randomly um, selected amino acids forming a, a functional stable structure is one in 10 raised to the 74th power, which is an astronomical rarity of a stable and functional protein structures within that vast array of combinatorial possibilities. Um, and uh, there's the conclusion uh, from his paper there. Um, so this presents us with a needle and a haystack problem. Locating the functional folds within that vast combinatorial space is like finding a tiny, tiny needle and an enormous haystack and having a very, very limited time to search. But I just want to be generous, and there's much more that could be discussed, such as the homochirality problem and your, forming the first uh, membranes and so on. But I, I just want to assume conservatively that the probability on atheism of, attain, of uh, getting the origins of life is something less than uh, 0.1%, which I think is an outrageously uh, generous assumption. What, though, about the origins of um, molecular machines that we find in the cell. The cell is governed by little um, nano machines, uh, which form many of the basic jobs. These are themselves formed of proteins, which are crafted specifically in various ways to work together, to interact together, to produce uh, uh, machine functions. Uh, Charles Darwin, of course, in uh, The Origins of Species, published in 1859, um, put forward a prediction by which we could test the validity of his theory, namely that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not be possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And um, in 1996, um, Michael Behe of Lehigh University, who's a biochemist, sought to take up Darwin's challenge. Um, and he defines irreducible complexity um, as follows. Um, he says, by irreducible complex, irreducible complex structures in the cell, I mean a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts to contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Um, here we see just a, an array of some of the, the machines that we find in the cell, famously the bacterial flagellum on the top left, which is a rotary motor that propels uh, various bacteria through medium. We see uh, the metallic spindle apparatus, which is my own area of expertise. Uh, we see um, the DNA replication machinery, the replosome on the top right there. And then at the bottom right, we see um, the cell division machinery and bacteria, which is also extraordinarily complex. Happy to talk about any of these if we want um, to dive, dive into that. Um, but all of these systems require multiple interacting proteins in order to perform their jobs. And I would argue that all of these uh, qualify um, under the definition of irreducible complexity and thus pose a challenge to the neo-Darwinian evolutionary mechanisms. So um, what's the probability then on atheism, granting all these other things of molecular machines arising? I'm just gonna say for the purpose of argument that it's something less than 0.1%. That's all I need for this argument. Um, what then though about multicellularity in, in the cell? Because you, 
we um, as embodied agents, embodied moral agents, aren't composed of just one cell type, but but hundreds, even thousands of cell types. Um, and uh, um, I'm just going to grant. I'm not going to get into the details of this. We can get to the science if we want to later. But for the purpose of time, um, I'm just going to say that the probability on atheism, on the hypothesis of atheism, is just something less than 0.1 percent. That's all I need for this argument. Um, the origins of animal body plans, and, and uh, which um, and the origins of the development of pathways that lead to their their construction, um, also I think is um, uh, is um, probabilistically prohibitive um, on the Darwinian scenario. Uh, if you imagine here, we have uh, the the zygote or the fertilized egg, um, and uh, on leading to the the um, adult form capable of reproduction. This is C. elegans, which is a roundworm, to a very well known model organism in the biological sciences. Um, what is the uh, to go from the zygote to the to the um, final form capable of reproduction, you need to go through this developmental cascade. It basically works through a process of, sub of, um, of um, cell differentiation and specification. Um, there's different types of cells, different, different jobs, and um, the first cell divides into two, and then into four daughter cells, into 16, and so forth. And it's a very complicated uh, process. But notice that you have to go all the way from the zygote all the way to the um, adult, the, the, the form capable of reproduction. If you stop midway across that developmental pathway, you don't have a live organism, you have a viable organism, you have a dead organism. You have to get traversed all the way across. But what are the odds that a process lacking foresight could produce such a developmental pathway? I, I think it's very improbable on the hypothesis of atheism. But just for the purpose of argument, I'm just going to assert that the probability of such a developmental pathway emerging on atheism is something less than 0.1%. Um, what though about uh, the origins of uh, consciousness uh, in the cell? Um, uh, sorry, consciousness in in in, uh, in co conscious embod in embodied agents, sentient sentient life forms. Um, uh, no notice that there's there's nothing in known physics that would allow someone to look at the brain and conclude, you know, there there's someone in there. Uh, this this thing has first person experiences. So we can't predict consciousness by way of physics and seeing the brain. Now, one might be tempted to think here that only brains with subjective experiences would avoid pain and so forth, and so we can predict that consciousness would evolve because it's adaptive. But that's also um, incorrect, because only people who believe in souls think the mind can affect the brain like that. Almost all atheists would say that your brain would do what it does, even if no consciousness existed, because it's a physically closed machine. All your neurons would fire just the same without you and move your body the same way. Evolutionary history would be identical without subjective experience. Um, but for the purpose of argument, I'm just going to say that the probability of consciousness emerging on atheism is 0.1%. And then, of course, we need um, the, moral, the origins of moral sensibilities um, in these sentient creatures, um, which I'm also going to assign a probability of 0.1%. I think being very, very generous each step in the process here. Um, and I'm going to be charitable, of course, and assume that these are the only things the atheist needs for a moral arena. Now let's multiply the upper bound of all these numbers together, and here we get my personal calculation for how um, expected a moral arena is on atheism. And you can see that it's, um, it's on the order of 1 times 10 to the minus 24th power, which is even uh, granting uh, um, the enormously generous assumptions is um, staggeringly improbable. And since 0.01, .01, which is the hypothesis I gave uh, for the, the probability I gave for the hypothesis of the moral arena on theism, is much, much greater than, than that probability. Therefore, the moral arena is strong evidence for theism over atheism. But you might remember the, pro the prior probability I assigned of 10 to the minus 20, which I think is also an absurdly, outrageously generous assumption, the, pro the prior probability of theism. Well, the weight of the evidence that we just adduced is sufficient to overcome a prior probability of 10 to the minus 20 and obtain a posterior odds of 0 0.9999. And so with that, I conclude um, and argue that uh, even though I've been outrageously generous at each step in this calculation, the, uh, the evidence strongly favors theism over atheism, even given a very, very low prior probability of theism. And thus, we should affirm the, the proposition that indeed God exists. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jonathan McClatchy. We will now move into the opening statement from Tom Jump. So with that, Tom, I am going to set the clock for 20 minutes. You don't have to use all of it, but if you want to, you're more than welcome to as 
you have an enchanting voice. So the floor is yours. All right, so the question today is, does God exist? Uh, and, well, I can say not the Christian God. It's possible that there is a deistic kind of a God, but the Christian Abrahamic God of the Bible definitely does not exist. We can know this for two reasons. Firstly, there is no reason to believe in the existence of such a God. There is no evidence nor argument that indicates a God any more than any of the non-God alternatives. Second, there are many good reasons to believe the Christian God does not exist, such as the contradictory nature of its properties. So the most reasonable position is, no, God does not exist. The Christian God, like Zeus, Fairies, and Helios, is just a made up by human imagination to explain questions we simply do not have the answer to yet. Zeus was the explanation of lightning, fairies were the explanation of fairy circles, Helios was the explanation of the motion of the sun in the sky. Likewise, the Christian God is just an explanation of how the universe started, the fine tuning, morality, purpose, meaning. Just as lightning was the lightning and the motion of the planets were not explained two thousand years ago, these things have not been fully explained today, so a god is invoked to explain them. We can demonstrate these our examples are the same because if someone says lightning was created by Zeus, to counter this, all you need to do is say, no, lightning was created by an unknown natural cause. Now we have two unsupported assertions to explain the unknown thing, so how do we tell which one is correct? There needs to be some kind of evidence to indicate one over the other. Imagine you have a box. If you said there was a rabbit in the box, and the reason we can know there is a rabbit in the box is because the box weighs two pounds, the fact the box weighs two pounds is not evidence of a rabbit because the two pounds could be explained by a coffee mug or a lizard or a two pound weight or Legos or infinitely many other equally likely alternatives. The same thing applies to the origin of the universe, the fine tuning, the morality. All of these could be explained by a god, but they could also be explained by the flying spaghetti monster or an unknown natural cause. Now we have two or three unsupported explanations, including to, to explain the unknown thing. So how do we tell which is correct? There needs to be some kind of evidence to indicate one over the alternatives. If any evidence you present can be equally explained by the non-God, then it is not actually evidence of a God. If all evidence and argument presented can be equally explained cumulatively by a non-God, then there is no evidence of a God. And all the examples apologists use, like the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning, morality, etc., are all just simply things we don't know the answer to, to which God has been slapped on as a made-on explanation, just like Zeus was to explain lightning, and fairy was, fairies were to explain fairy circles, and Helios was to explain the motion of the sun, arguments from ignorance. For example, the origin of the universe can be explained by an all-powerful eternal thing, such as naturalistic pantheism. The fine-tuning can be explained by the boundary conditions being intertwined by an undiscovered uh, unifying force or law of nature grounded in naturalistic pantheism. Objective morality can be explained by undiscovered laws of nature like gravity which permeates the universe grounded in naturalistic pantheism. All of these together can be explained by non-god alternatives better or equally to a god. Therefore, none of these examples are actually evidence of a god, they're just arguments from ignorance. Most theist arguments are of the form, the natural can't explain, therefore the supernatural. There could absolutely be a supernatural out there, I can't say there isn't, and I can't say what its limitations are. I can't say the supernatural can or can't do this or that because it hasn't been discovered yet, so how could I possibly know what it can or cannot do? It would be a contradiction for me to say the supernatural hasn't been discovered, yet it, can, it can't do X, Y, and Z. That's like saying, oh look, an unidentified flying object, it must be aliens. If it's unidentified, you can't identify it as aliens, that's a contradiction. But just like this applies to the supernatural, it also applies to the unknown natural. Just like it is a contradiction for me to say the supernatural can't do X, Y, and Z, it's a contradiction for the theist to say the unknown natural can't do X, Y, and Z, because both the natural, both the supernatural and the unknown natural are undiscovered, so we, for both we can't say what it can or can't do. Therefore, anything the supernatural can explain, the unknown natural can explain. In other words, anything a god can explain can be explained by unknown natural forces. The reason science doesn't have answers for these questions, like the origin of everything, objective morality, is because science is limited to verifiable things, combinations of principles, particles, and laws in physics. There is no combination of these things that gets us any omni-property like all-powerful or all-knowing or all-loving. These are not combinations of verifiable properties, they're just made up. And In science, we're not allowed to use made-up properties because it's not a combination of verifiable things. Scientists could, however, at any time just add these omni-properties to a theory, like saying general relativity. Let's just say general relativity is all-powerful and explains the origin of everything. We don't need a god anymore, problem solved. We have an equally good explanation of a god to the origin of everything by just adding this omni-property to any scientific theory. Anyone can add unsupported properties to an explanation to make it explain the unknown. If what theologians are doing by adding these omni-properties to their explanation actually counted as evidence, then scientists would do it. But scientists don't do it because they can't, the, or the properties can be attributed to any natural thing, and so it's not a form of evidence. It's like, why don't we just use a magic eight ball and just shake it 
the same reason. It's just made up. As a final note, we have good reason to believe the Christian God does not exist because if an all-good, all-powerful God existed, then it would have created a world without involuntary suffering. It is immoral to force people to live in a world without their consent. We did not give consent to live in this world, and therefore, if a God created us and placed us in this world, it would necessarily be immoral. So there cannot be a morally good God that created us. The legal definition of slavery is a person owned by someone else under the control of someone else or forced to work for another's purpose without consent. A slave is considered as a property of another uh, as the one controlling them purchases them or owns them from their birth or creation in this case. If God creates being and forces us to live in this world without, with involuntary suffering, without our consent, to fill his purposes, whatever they may be, that is by definition slavery and by definition immoral. Also, if we were forced to choose between heaven and hell, we don't have the option to go to a universe of our own preferred design. That means I am being forced to live for God's purposes without my consent, which is by definition slavery, by definition immoral. An all-good, all-powerful God could never do this. So the Christian God is impossibility and definitely does not exist by its own definition and what it says that God has done in the Bible. If an all-good, all-powerful God existed, it would have given every, each and every being individually the option to live in a world of their own preferred design or the design of the God, if they so choose. But it would never force people to live in a world without their consent. In conclusion, there is no reason to believe in a God, just like there is no reason to believe in Zeus or the fairies or Helios, because anything the supernatural can explain, the unknown natural can explain. If adding omni properties worked as actual explanation, then scientists would do it, they don't, because it's not. And if there was an all good, all powerful God, it would have given each person the option to go to a universe of their preferred design, because forcing us to live in a world without consent is by definition slavery and by definition moral. So there cannot be an all good God. Gotcha. Thank you so much for your opening statement as well. And we will now move into first rebuttals. So these are 10 minutes. And Jonathan, I am setting the clock and we'll start it on your first bird. Oh, I think you might be on mute on Zoom. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, uh, Tom, for that uh, engaging presentation. Um, you met. You started off by saying that uh, that there might be a God, but uh, but definitely the the Christian God does not exist. Um, okay, but we're not debating whether the Christian God exists this evening. I mean, that's a topic in its own right. I'd be happy to do that on a future occasion. I have done it with other opponents, um, but this evening we're debating specifically does God exist, which is a much more minimal claim. And so I'd like to actually stick with the topic rather than ad adding auxiliary hypotheses, um, which are interesting to discuss, and I have discussed them in the past, but that's not the topic of this, the, the debate this evening. Um, you mentioned uh, the God of the gaps, like the, such as the, the, the belief in the past that the, light, the lightning was created by Zeus because people didn't understand how lightning was, was formed. But the arguments I presented are not a God of the gaps arguments. Uh, in fact, I argued that the uh, probability of the relevant evidence given theism is much greater, much, much, much greater uh, um, on the hypothesis of theism than it is on the hypothesis of atheism. And, the, and thus, uh, it, it's a positive argument. It's arguing that, uh, that the evidence that's before us strongly supports theism over atheism. Furthermore, the, the various arguments for God, none of them are, are God of the gaps arguments. For example, um, I'm um, a fan of the intelligent design argument as what I spent most of my um, my um, time working on uh, when it comes to natural theology um, and, uh, and, uh, and and science. And, and the intelligent design argument is an argument based not on a God of the gaps premise, but is actually an argument based rather than on ignorance and what we do know about the cause and effect structure of the world, namely that we know that certain types of effects are the results of certain types of causes and it's, it's based on the standard principles of scientific reasoning with respect to the past the uh, uniformitarian principle of the present being the key to the past that was pioneered by the uh, 19th century geologist charles Lyell and his big principles of geology where he argued that if you want to explain um, effects in the remote past we should let our present experience of cause and effect guide our search for the best explanation and and so when it comes to uh, for example, if, you want, if you're on an uncharted island and you discover white powdery stuff, will you favor the volcanic eruption hypothesis over the flood or earthquake hypothesis simply because in every realm of experience, that white powdery stuff, which is volcanic ash, comes from volcanic eruptions, not from floods or earthquakes. And so it's, a, it's an inference to the best explanation rather than something we don't know. I've never seen anyone put forward a, an argument 
for is used being the best explanation of lightning, although if, you, if you've if you got a source for that, I would like to see it. Um, he mentioned uh, the the rabbit in the box. Um, that he says if he hypothesizes or tells me there's a, there's a rabbit in the box and hands me the box and the box weighs two pounds, well, that could be explained by rabbit being in the box, but it could also be explained by something else of equivalent weight being in the box, uh, and that, that is true. Um, but nonetheless, it would still be evidence for the hypothesis that there's a rabbit in the box. It might be, not be strong evidence, but it raises the probability of that hypothesis, and thus it is evidence of some form, even if it is weak evidence. Um, and I, I, I'm, unfor I'm afraid to say that I think my opponent has a mistaken view of what constitutes evidence. Um, he, uh, if, if you eliminate hypotheses, uh, if we say we have, let's say we have uh, four hypotheses. Um, that are contending for the um, for the best explanation of the of the of the evidence, and we can eliminate one of those hypotheses. Then we have redistributed the probabilities. So you've now provided evidence that raises the probability of the remaining three hypotheses, unless you've provided evidence um, for these for these hypotheses. And so, insofar as I can discredit naturalism, for example, which is the the most consistent way I would argue of being an atheist, I have eliminated. Um, I, I've, I've significantly raised the probability of theism being true, and thus I provided um, evidence for theism. Um, likewise, if, if we're looking at the, the fine-tuning of our universe and we have three contending hypotheses, namely uh, and the, the chance hypothesis, the, necess the physical necessity hypothesis, and the design hypothesis, if I eliminate either the necessity hypothesis or the chance hypothesis, I have, even if I leave two contending hypotheses remaining, I've still provided evidence for the design thesis. Um, and one thing that we like to do when we have multiple uh, hypotheses which explain the data equally well is we look for further evidence, and then that um, that uh, then can help distinguish between these remaining possibilities. But you, you but in eliminating possibilities by redistributing the probabilities in that way, you have provided evidence for your hypothesis. So I disagree with him, uh, with Tom uh, at an epistemological level at that point. Um, so he's, he said that if evidence can be explained by non-God, then it's not evidence for God. Not necessarily. Um, I mean, you can invoke uh, an infinite number of ad hoc hypotheses, um, but the uh, that, that's why in Bayes' theorem, we take into consideration the prior probability as well as the, as the evidence. Um, so uh, the prior probability um, is expressed as a ratio, and, and it could be anywhere between zero and one. Uh, a prior probability of one uh, is true definitionally, like two plus two equals four, of course. Um, that can't not be true. There's no amount of evidence that could overturn that. Um, and uh, the concept of a married bachelor, on the other hand, has a prior probability of zero. No amount of evidence could is, could warrant a belief that there exists a married bachelor because it's, it's, it's self-contradictory. Um, most prior probabilities, of course, are within that range of zero to one. Um, and uh, and, I, and so long as the prior probability is non-zero, in principle, you can uh, confirm any proposition by by means of evidence if you have enough evidence that is that is um, sufficient relative to the prior probability of the hypothesis being true, which relates to the intrinsic plausibility um, of the hypothesis. Um, he mentioned uh, naturalistic pantheism uh, as as a potential. Uh, candidate for explaining the evidence which I uh, um, explained by, by God. Uh, I would like, um, perhaps we can get to this in the cross-examination, or perhaps uh, Tom could elaborate in his rebuttal what exactly he means by naturalistic pantheism. I have watched several of his past debates, and I know he's a, as a fan of championing this argument uh, or this hypothesis, um, but, I, but I've never been quite clear exactly what he means by that, and it seems that the more detail that he gives to the hypothesis, the more far-fetched and the more implausible uh, it appears to be. And, and uh, insofar as it explains the data, the, the more that he modifies the hypothesis to explain the data, the more it seems like theism. Um, and so I, I would like him to give me some more detail on what naturalistic pantheism actually is in his view, and his understanding. Furthermore, I would like to hear Tom Jump's view, uh, because I understand that he's actually not a naturalistic pantheist, but he's uh, but he likes to... Um, Use naturalistic pantheism as his, as his typical response to uh, theistic apologists. Uh, I would like to hear what Tom Jump's own personal perspective is um, and how he explains the evidence, not how a naturalistic pantheist might explain the evidence. Um, um, furthermore, I would like to point out that uh, the different hypotheses are adjudicated um, by virtue of various uh, criteria. One is explanatory power, 
Of course, their ability to explain the, the evidences singularly, but we also have the explanatory scope. That is the ability to explain not just single pieces of evidence, but the, the scope or the range of evidences that exist. And I would argue that the evidence for theism uh, is not just extensive, but it's also varied in kind. It, expla it explains not just um, one form of evidence, but multiple forms of evidence. Uh, we have the, the or why is there something rather than nothing? The cosmological argument the universe began to exist, um, and God being the best explanation of that. We have the, the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics. We have the origins of life and the information content in the cell. We have um, the, mole the molecular machines and, and the, the processes requiring foresight, such as metamorphosis and, and developmental biology and so forth. Um, we have uh, the ethical norms and duties in the world, etc. And all of these cumulatively point to uh, th theism. Um, and so uh, alternative explanations, ha um, you, uh, to explain the data alternatively, you have to invoke multiple independent hypotheses to explain all of these uh, phenomena. Whereas uh, theism explains all the data by invoking only a single hypothesis, and thus it has greater explanatory scope. Um, also, um, another uh, criterion of a, of a good hypothesis is plausibility, and that relates, of course, to its intrinsic or prior probability. Uh, and, uh, and I would argue that his hypothesis of, um, of um, naturalistic pantheism is implausible. Not to mention, of course, that uh, the evidence that our universe is temporally finite argues against... Uh, uh, naturalistic pantheism, I would argue, because the universe began to exist, and so it doesn't exist out of self-necessity, out of the necessity of its own nature, but it's in fact contingent, and uh, contingency, I think, is a problem for, an, for a pantheistic hypothesis. Um, he mentioned involuntary suffering as well. Oh, I've only got 30 seconds. <laughs> um, maybe we can get into that later, um, but I'll um, just uh, conclude by saying that uh, I think that Tom has, um, I think, a flawed epistemology he doesn't understand what evidence is and how we evaluate competing claims and how we um, evaluate claims based on the criteria of explanatory power explanatory scope and plausibility and so hopefully we can discuss this in more depth uh, during the cross-examination but thanks for your attention thank you very much Jonathan from there we will go into the 10 minute opening or I should say 10 minute first rebuttal from Tom jump and Tom I have got the clock set for you. One second, I want to mention, anybody has questions, feel free to put at Modern Day Debate in the live chat and then ask your question for whoever you want to ask. Putting at Modern Day Debate just helps me see it a little bit better as I pull those questions out and put them in a list for the Q&A at the end. So Tom, thanks so much. The floor is yours. All right, I'd like to start by saying, yes, every version of the intelligent design argument is an argument from ignorance, every single one of them, all of them, no matter what. Uh, they're essentially just saying, here's something we can't explain with natural causes. We're going to make an argument from analogy to intelligent design, therefore intelligent design. Argument from ignorance straight off the bat, no matter what, in every case, from every field, in every, every level of academic, it's all an argument from ignorance. Um, no, uh, Jonathan got it wrong. Uh, I, my argument is that naturalistic pantheism is the one and only criteria I'm using to explain all of the data. Every one of the arguments can be explained by naturalistic pantheism, just like they can be theism, so it has equal explanatory scope and equal explanatory power in every respect, including the prior probabilities can be equal in everything, or better in everything. So that so he, he was incorrect when he was characterizing naturalistic pantheism that way. Naturalistic pantheism is just an eternal, all-powerful nature. So God's properties are eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, conscious, personal, um, and all good. So if we just take naturalistic pantheism as just two of those six, seven properties, and so if naturalistic pantheism is untenable or unplausible, then God is by definition necessarily more untenable or unplausible because it's only using properties of a God. And by eternal, that could mean outside of space or time or whatever variation of eternal you want to put in there. So again, everything that you put in for the probabilities of Jonathan's argument can be, I can just, let's say, grant all of that because that there are multiple different kinds of gods, you have to multiply that probability by the possible number of potential gods, and then you get the probability of theism. So, like, for example, there could be a god that would not create life. And so the probability of life uh, just got cut in half under his model because there's a theist god who would create life and a theist god who would not create life. And there's possibly a god who would create black hole universes. You just got cut in half again. Now you have 33% of whatever probability you assign to theism now or to atheism theism now has 33 percent less likely to produce life than an atheistic universe because there are these different variations of a god and because there are essentially infinitely many variations of a god 
there's infinitely much less likely to get a life in the universe with a god than without one. So I can essentially just grant Jonathan's argument and it works to disprove his position uh, that theism, that life is more likely under theism than under atheism. All he's done is make up a theistic god and say, well, if there's something that's going to design life, well, then life is more likely to occur. Well, I can just say, if naturalistic pantheism is determined in such a way to create a life permitting universe, then the probability of a life permitting universe under atheism is one in one. 100%. Or just I can, again, add in lots of random criteria to make it any number I want, like the 1% he presented for theism. No difference there. So his argument adds up to essentially nothing. Um, he, he said that the most moral actions can only be done in a moral arena. That's an assumption unsupported. I see no evidence to support that at all. Uh, we can definitely have um, more moral worlds without embodied beings, or we can have beings who can interact in a similar way in just ethereal ways. So no, there's no reason to suppose we need embodied beings for any moral action. Uh, assuming that because something is implausible in the universe, like life permitting, like a, or a moral arena, as he put it, that the universe was therefore designed for that thing, completely unsupported assumption. I could just do the same thing with astatine or any highly rare element that's more rare than life and say that because this is rare in the universe, the universe must have been designed for this thing. Therefore, his entire argument is undermined because it must have been created by the spaghetti monster for astatine. Like, no, the fact that something is unlikely in the universe does not in any way imply that the universe was designed for that thing. Um, what else we got? Uh, he missed the point on the evidence thing. I did not say that when I said that it, whatever he presents is not evidence of a god, I said it's not evidence of a god over a non-god. So if you have evidence that you present for a god, and that evidence can be equally explained by a non-god, equally in every respect, including the prior probabilities, then it is not evidence of a god. Now, if you want to say that it's underdetermined and that it can be explained by infinitely many things, which then increases the probability some minusculely infinitesimal amount, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that, but it's still not evidence of a god if it can be equally explained by a non-god, which is my argument. So we missed the point on that one. Um, let's see. Did I miss anything? Oh, no form of information is contingent on intelligent agents. All of the definitions of information from Shannon complexity to Kolgamorov Kul complexity to physics information in, uh, in how physics defines it and biological information, none of those have anything to do with an agent. No academic definition of intelligence has anything to do with an intelligent agent. It all has to do with information being a natural property of matter. So he, I don't know where he's getting that from. It's just it's not an academically supported position. Um, the Bayesian epistemology has a number of problems, such as the problem of the priors. Essentially, priors are made up. If, if you don't have an empirical basis for priors, they're made up. You can make them up. You can change them to do whatever you want, uh, which is why Richard Carrier uses the problem, or uses Bayesian epistemology to show Jesus never existed. And Richard Swinburne uses Bayesian epistemology to show that Jesus likely rose from the dead. Bayesian epistemology only applies in cases where we have an empirical basis. If we don't, it's junk. It's just made up. Um, checking my notes, see if I missed anything else. I think that's good. I think, I, think, I think I'm good. Thanks so much. Next, we will go into second rebuttal. So thank you very much. And I am setting the timer for five minutes. So then we will jump into cross-examination after that, which is my favorite part. So without any further ado, thanks so much. The floor is yours, Jonathan. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom, once again uh, for that engaging rebuttal. Um, you mentioned that every ID argument is an argument from ignorance, completely untrue. Even if something's wrong with the arguments for design, it's certainly not wrong because it's an argument from ignorance, uh, because it makes a positive argument. And if you're making a positive argument, it, whatever else might be wrong with it is not an argument from ignorance. Uh, the argument for design is that there are certain features of biological systems in particular, which are best explained as a product of an intelligent source, and therefore, um, we invoke intelligent source to explain their origins. Um, so information content, for example, um, it, especially in digital form, is something that we habitually associate in every realm of experience with conscious activity or design. And so when we find information content in the form, uh, encoded di in digital form, in terms of the red molecules of DNA and RNA, we infer the best explanation of that information is it too arose by virtue of an intelligent cause. And so it's, it's not an argument for ignorance, whatever else might be wrong with, it, with the argument. Um, uh, so, so that's just that uh, is, is incorrect, I'm afraid. Um, 
he mentioned that every piece of evidence that I went over can be explained by naturalistic pantheism. Um, but uh, part of the a key part of the argument was the goodness of God, God's moral character, and God being uh, um, being morally morally good, um, and thus uh, that that is part of the, the the reason why he plausibly has motivation for bringing out a moral arena. Um, a moral choice arena where people can shape and mold their character in moral significant ways. Um, so, so I, I would like to see how naturalistic pantheism gets on uh, um, with providing a, a plausible rationale for why uh, we would expect to see a, a moral arena on the hypothesis of naturalistic pantheism. And of course, to, to um, I would argue that um, morality itself uh, presupposes uh, some sort of mind or, um, or consciousness. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to see how he um, defines naturalistic pantheism. Uh, in such a way, um, he mentioned that uh, that there could be a, a god who would not create um, a, a universe, and so the probability, uh, or would not create life, and so the probability has been cut in half, um, etc. Um, that well, uh, that could be true. I, I didn't. I, I argued that, in fact, I actually, in, in my argument, I granted that the. Um, the probability of a moral arena existing on theism was low. I even said um, that for being conservative, I'll make it 1% probability on theism. I could even go further and make it 0.0001% and I would still have a very powerful argument for theism uh, based on the uh, what, what I presented in my opening statement. So um, I, I don't buy that objection. Uh, he said, why do we need embodied beings? Uh, why couldn't we have um, like uh, spiritual beings or something in, in participating in a moral arena or ethereal beings? Well, let me just go over this part of the argument again. So on the hypothesis of theism, a moral choice arena is something that God could be plausibly expected to bring about. Why? Because intrinsic to God's very character is the quality of moral goodness. And because of this, it's not unlikely for an omnipotent and omnibenevolent entity to bring about the greatest goods. Now, since the greatest goods require a community of embodied moral agents in a moral choice arena, this is something that it might be plausibly expected for God to bring about. One, uh, and, and of course, um, um, Tom brings up this objection that, well, um, why would God be expected to bring, to choose to bring about embodied agents? Well, um, um, it's, it's being embodied specifically that amplifies our ability as agents to affect the world and each other. Uh, a world of physical pushes and pulls greatly increases the number of opportunities for free agents to morally flourish, mold their character, and cooperate with one another. And remember, I didn't. I, I, my argument doesn't rest upon the probability of a moral agent existing given the hypothesis of theism being high, in fact, my argument assumed the probability is low, um, even as low as 1% probability. So um, so that's, that's all I need for this argument. Um, he said, because something is unlikely in the universe doesn't mean the universe was designed for that. I completely agree with that, but no, one, I don't know anyone that argues that. Um, uh, it's as I said, we, we have two probabilities. We're considering the probability of the moral arena on theism and the probability of the evidence on, ath on atheism. Um, and uh, uh, even uh, framing arguments around specified complexity, which is a concept uh, developed by uh, William Dembski, which says that we infer design in the, in the universe um, when, things meet, when a phenomenon meets two criteria, namely complexity and specification. Um, it, it, and probability is only one of the criteria. We've also got specification, which is conformity to an independently given pattern. Um, uh, let's see, he said um, n there's no academic definition of information uh, that has anything to do with intelligence. I I'd beg to differ with him on, on this, um, but since I'm virtually out of time, we'll have to wait till the cross-examination to discuss this. Thank you. Gotcha. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And now we will go to the second rebuttal from Tom Jump. So, Tom, I have got the clock set, and I will start on your first word. All right, so any argument from ignorance can be rephrased as a positive argument. So all of the arguments from design are arguments from ignorance veiled as a positive argument where you just say, here's something we can't explain. Oh, but we can explain it. Ah, and we're just going to brush over that part where we can't explain it and just say we can explain it as X. And that's more likely. It's still an argument from ignorance. Um, Jonathan said that the reason God would create a universe like this one is because of it's part of his nature. Oh, well, that's fantastic. I can just say naturalistic pantheism can create a universe like this one because it's a part of its nature. Ah, poof, now we have equal probabilities there. Uh, Jonathan misunderstood the argument I was making when I said that there could be a God that would create a different kind of a universe. If there are multiple kinds of gods that could create different kinds of a universe, you have to take whatever probability you have for atheism without a God, and you have to multiply that by the probability of the gods, which means no matter what, if there's more than one possible God, you get a lower number, necessarily. So for example, uh, 
if you have the probability of a life remaining universe under theism being 0 0.0001, you have to multiply that by the number of gods because there couldn't be a god that could create any of those possible universes and more. So it, it, any multiple types of god necessarily defeat, is a defeater of his argument completely and entirely. Um, the probability of a life remaining universe under theism, whatever number you apply, is going to be less than the probability of atheism. Because all atheism is doing is saying, we don't know what caused the universe. Theism is just making up an explanation of this caused the universe. Atheists can do the same thing. We can just say, pantheism caused the universe. And now we can match your probabilities, whatever they are, 100%. So, and anything that can be done as embodied agents can be done without being embodied. You don't need to be embodied. It's just an assumption that non-embodied things can't have certain kinds of interactions which is, again, an argument from ignorance. We don't know what non-embodied agents can or can't do. We only know what embodied agents can do. So assuming you can't have these kinds of things without being embodied is, again, just an argument from ignorance. So that is not a valid argument at all. It's just an assumption. Uh, I think that covers it for my rebuttal. Gotcha. Thanks so much. And we will now go into the cross-examination. So I'm setting the timer for 10 minutes. And we will first have Jonathan McClatchy interrogating Tom Jump. So, Got the timer set, and the floor is yours, Jonathan. Oh, we still on mute. Sorry. Oh, All right. Sorry. Uh, Tom, thanks uh, for your rebuttal. Um, let's, uh, there's so much to discuss. Um, let's start with, uh, you said that an argument from ignorance can be articulated as a positive argument. They're referring to intelligent design arguments for design, and I would argue, of course, design um, arguments are in turn evidence for theism because they raise the, the, the they raise the probability of theism being true and thus constitute evidence for theism if we can detect design in nature. Um, uh, so I, I'm I'm curious as to why you think it's an argument from ignorance to argue in the abductive way that I described. Because it's the same for lightning, you can say, ah, well, hey, look, there are sparks in the sky. We can create sparks with hammer. Therefore, it must be just a big hammer in the sky created by Thor or Zeus. It's the same thing. You can just rephrase the exact same analogy argument and make it for lightning or fairy circles or Helios and the sun. You can do everything. That's exactly what they were doing. Oh, look, the sun is moving through the sky and we can drag stuff with horses. Therefore, the sun is being dragged by horses. It's a positive argument saying that we can explain this and it's more likely to be explained by this analogous thing that we experience uh, than to some unknown. It's just an argument from ignorance. But in every realm of experience, when we find specified complex, it's complex and specified information content, especially when it's encoded in digital form, it routinely finds its source with an intelligent agent. Uh, so is uh, it not rational then? So you there? Uh, there is no such thing. There's no such thing as specified complexity. It's a made up property. There, it doesn't exist in biology. It doesn't exist in physics. It's a made up property. When uh, we find in, in, in science and physics and biology, it's just a property of nature. It doesn't exist as a mind at all. So I, I'm not sure what you're saying just doesn't cohere with anything in the scientific literature that I'm aware of. Well, I, I can I could actually cite you multiple, actually many, many papers which do talk about specified complexity. Um, but well, I, I, I can too, because Stephen Myers and the guys who invaded it is just pseudoscience. I mean, I, when I look at the actual academic consensus on this, it's not accepted as something... Uh, I mean, I would... I, I would encourage you or the listeners or viewers to, to go to evoinfo.org, which is the lab of the Evolutionary Informatics Lab, uh, the website of the Evolutionary Informatics Lab, uh, which is um, which is uh, Bob Marks and Bill Demsky's material on specified complexity, Winston Ewers and others, um, which is, is a really great resource. Is also academic. I mean, uh, the design inference was academically peer reviewed, um, which is William Demsky's uh, monograph where he discusses the concept of specified complexity. Um, so, I mean, I, I could give you tons of literature on, on this topic. Right, so. right. I've read all of that. Myers and Dimsky are, are cranks, considered to be cranks by pretty much everybody in the academic community. Well, that's not an argument. That, that's at hominem. I mean, oh, you, I know, you, no, no. What I'm saying is that their, their stuff, when reviewed, has m numerous flaws. Like, for example, Dimsky's is a, it's a Barry fallacy. He's conflating Kolgomorov and Shannon complexity to make his new kind of infused complexity, which is just... Uh, a made-up thing which you can arbitrarily get anything you want from because when analyzed it just doesn't work it does not anal it doesn't articulate any coherent idea in information theory like I have the papers I can happily send these to you Dimsky and Meyer's work has been completely refuted which is why they're considered to be cranks in the field of biology I actually I completely disagree with you and I, I've read the relevant literature as well um, uh, I mean, in fact actually the arguments for common descent uh, are largely based on the arguments from specified complexity um, so if you're going to if you're going to reject B, uh, Dembski's concept of specific complexity, you also have to throw out most of the arguments for universal common ancestry. 
Um, no, because they're not using Stimsky's definition of specified complexity. They're, you're using a different definition. They're, they're using the same Both concept, uh, and wh whatever they call it, it's the same concept um, that you have in probability. So, for example, let's take the um, distribution of retroviral elements in, in primate genomes, for example, which is a, a popular argument for common ancestry. Um, you know, any distribution of retroviral elements uh, in primate genomes is equally improbable as any other, but what is the, the argument for common ancestry is predicated upon the fact that uh, you find them in shared sites and you find point mutations within them which form a nested hierarchical distribution, etc. Um, so uh, if you want to throw out that concept, you also have to throw out most of the arguments for common ancestry. No, because the ones in biology use something like Shannon information theory, which defines information as a stochastic system. Any stochastic system is a is can give you information, which is stochastic system is just any random system which can have uh, discernible differences. So in the biological system, it has no reference to intelligence there at all. You can get information. You can get what what you're referring to as specified complexity. I don't think they use that terminology, but you you can get that without intelligence, and that I'm totally okay with. That's totally consistent with my worldview. It's when you add in this uh, underlying assumption of intelligence, which is the unsupported uh, crank side of it. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I completely disagree with you. Um, I mean, the, the, what, you, you, so Shan information is, um, it, re, it relates to reduction of uncertainty, and it, it's, it, it co is correlated with complexity. Um, so as you increase the complexity of something, you have more Shan information. As you reduce more uncertainty, you have more uh, Shan information. Uh, and it's the specified complexity concept is is Shan information, but it's more than merely Shan information. Namely, it has a semiotic dimension. It, it can it communicates information. It has communicative properties. Um, so when you read the paragraphs and pages of a book, you recognize that that's the product of of design because um, because of the the there, there's an there's an astronomical rarity of functional sequences of alphabetic characters relative to uh, the combinatorial space of possible ways there are. There's much more ways of writing gibberish than there are ways of writing functional sentences. Would you not agree? No, that's the incorrect part. The, the, the anal analysis here is that when you have an arbitrary language and an arbitrary meaning of that language, that's when it becomes possibly intelligent. But there isn't an arbitrary number of ways that um, life can survive. Like, it's not like if you put the ATCG in like GTCA, well then it, it could totally just work that way, it just happens not to. There's a physical limitation to the possibilities of the way the information can be read. So that's the difference between a book, which means we could just write gobbledygook and have it mean this means rabbit or whatever. We can just arbitrarily label whatever combination of letters we want to mean whatever we want. But in biology that isn't the case. There is a physical limitation to what systems can form in a life permitting way. And so it's determined that the meaning essentially is derived from the shape, which is why because proteins operate on how they fold and how they which is how they transfer the information. So it's not an arbitrary language like a human language where we can just make up the meaning and the word itself. It has a physical limitation which means it's more likely to be determined like a naturalistic system. What do you mean determined like sorry I'm I'm not following um, your, um your okay so so if you have, like, language is arbitrary. We can make anything mean anything. There's, there's no limitations there, right? Would you, you follow me so far? But, but we, have, we have a conventional genetic code. Uh, uh, you're right. So, so, so the, with language, English, yeah. the English language, like yeah. just any human language, we can make any word mean anything we want it to mean. Both the word itself and the meaning of that word are totally arbitrary, correct? Sure. There, there's a conventional language. Um, but, oh, right, yeah, right. Sure. I'm not arguing against that. It's just we, yeah. we could not that we do. Well, in sure. biology, that is not the case. In biology, like if you want a rock to roll down a hill, you can't have the hill go up. It's not going to work. There's only one way it can roll and that's down because the, the, law, the, the force right. of gravity pulls it down. So if you want the rock to roll down the hill, it's got to go down. The law of gravity isn't arbitrary. You can't just point the hill up and say, okay, we're going to have it go up now. So in biology, the same thing applies. If you want the biological system to survive, if you want to convey the information there isn't, a, you can't just point it in any direction you want. You can't make the folds in any direction you want and just say, okay, we're going to have this work. There is physical limitations to how the information can actually work, just like there are physical limitations to but, how but rocks you, fall. You, you, un you understand that, uh, that you can arrange the amino acids in any order, right? There, there's no physical limitation to, what, to the arrangement of amino acids or to nucleotide bases, right? There are actually because they can't bind and some kind can't bind with the others. But yes, yes, you can arrange the language in any way, but you can't arrange the meaning in any way. That's the difference. A, C, T, and G can be arranged in absolutely any order. That is a biological right. fact. 
Right. So, but the, I agree with that part. So that part's the first part. It's just like the language. We're going to arrange any right. English letters in the world. But the meaning cannot be. It is not arbitrary. The meaning for language, English language, is arbitrary. We can make a mean whatever we want. The meaning in biology isn't. It's determined. It's determined. What do you mean by that? Could meaning mean they can only function in certain circumstances, in physical circumstances. Like a rock can't roll up a hill. It has to roll down the hill. So the way the information is transferred in the cell and the DNA can only work if it has a certain kind of physical uh, constituency determined by the laws of physics. Well, sure, but I, I'm still not quite sure exactly what your objection is. So we, I mean, protein structures have to be crafted in specific ways to perform a job in the cell, and sometimes the protein structures have to be crafted in mutually cooperative ways so they can work together to perform a, a complex job or form part of a biosynthetic pathway or form a part of a molecular machine in the cell or something like that. Um, that you, you have a target within that vast combinatorial space. You have to find that target um, by, by a chance mechanism so as to be acted on by natural selection. Would you, would you disagree with what I'm saying? Yes, I agree. You, you do agree. Um, and for that target selection is something that we associate with design. It's the same with, uh, with no, 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 the development that, pathway. That, that part I don't agree with at all. That's just an assumption. You're saying, ah, who, look, here's a rare thing that we don't see with design. Like that's just that's exactly like saying we can smash hammers with an anvil and we see sparks and we see sparks in the sky with big lightning bolts. Therefore, Zeus. That's the argument from ignorance jump that is not supported and is completely rejected in most of biology. Like there is no connection there. Okay, it's that just makes an, sense. Like the, the Sidney Harris uh, picture where there's this complicated math and there's like, then a miracle happens and there's a complicated math that will we associate that with design which is what you just said that's the there's a miracle here which is completely unsupported there's nothing that gets you across that gap okay i think that's time thank you very much and jonathan is right we will now switch over to tom jump as he interrogates john or i should say jonathan so the clock is set for 10 minutes floor is yours tom all right, so you asked about how pantheism can ground morality. Uh, so God grounds morality because it's a part of his nature, right? Right. So I can just say pantheism grounds morality because it's a part of its nature. Okay, but it, it seems to me that you're, I mean, you're, you, so can you, can you just give me a, de a definition of what you mean when you say naturalistic pantheism again? Eternal, all powerful nature. Okay, and so how would you distinguish it from theism? It doesn't have consciousness. Okay, so so when you say naturalistic pantheism, do you mean that you're saying that the universe? Because normally, what people mean when they say pantheism is that, that God is the universe. No, that's an incorrect. Uh, that's one of the interpretations, but there's actually three branches of pantheism. The most common being the rejection of God. For example, if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, go down to the kinds of pantheism. The first one, number one, is physicalism, where it goes to the description of just the that nat naturalistic pantheism is essentially a world where all there is is things that don't go outside of the bounds of what is ontologically uh, verified or, or granted okay. by science or something like that. So, so you, if you said... Go down to, to clarify, if you go down sure. to the section on personal, it says Einstein was by definite was a pantheist who by definition rejected the idea of a personal god, and many pantheists identify that as the key feature of pantheism. There is no consciousness. Okay. So, so you said an uh, omnipotent universe, an all-powerful universe. Is that what you said? Yes, a powerful okay. eternal. Okay, and is it all-knowing as well, like God? No, no. Okay. it's just all powerful. It doesn't have okay. a brain. Okay, um, and so how would the how would this all-powerful? I mean, is is this all-powerful universe necessary or is it contingent? Necessary. It's necessary. So, so just, just to make a distinction, the universe itself, like our universe, is not necessary. Our universe is a contingent thing created by the necessary pantheism. So it's kind of like the multiverse. Okay. We have one small universe and then the bigger necessary thing behind it. Okay. So, so it's so it's another universe beyond our own, which is necessary. Is that what you're saying? Uh, sort of. It's it's the, the the word universe has multiple meanings in different fields. In philosophy, it means all things. In physics, right, okay. it means just the observable right. universe. And and I'm it's just. And is this universe that you're talking about governed by physical laws? No, our universe is governed by physical laws. Okay, so so the universe you're describing, the one that you're attributing this naturalistic pantheistic property to, that that does not have physical laws. It might, it might not. What governs it is unknown. So I would not. Physical laws are specifically only contingent to our universe, okay. and whether or not they apply to this thing is is unknown. And 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 so does it have particles like protons, neutrons, electrons? Unknown. Those are only things know. that are continuing. So, so I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I can't take your hypothesis seriously if you're not going to define it specifically enough for us to test it. 
why we can't test God, so I just say the same thing well, to God. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I can give you a definition of God, um, whereas you're, every time I ask you something, uh, something about the definition of naturalistic pantheism, you're saying, well, we don't know. Um, oh, well, so, you could pick, you could just pick, say no, okay. Right, so I, I would, in this case, what I would do is I'd say, how do you answer it for God? I'm just going to copy that answer and apply that because there's a broad spectrum of what naturalistic pantheism could be, so it could be either way. Okay. But I would try to go with whatever one is closest to your God that doesn't have conscience. So I would imagine you would say God is not made of particles. So for the sake of argument, I'll say no, pantheism is not made of particles, and no, pantheism does not adhere to the laws of physics. Or okay. it's not so are, subject. Are, are you a naturalistic pantheist yourself? No. Then what's your explanation of the evidence? Don't know. You don't know? Yeah. The, the correct okay. answer is... Here are all the things we don't know, and there we don't know the answer. That's the that's his correct explanation. Okay, so you you think that the evidence that I've used raises the probability of theism and naturalistic pantheism, correct? I'm sorry, your, your mouth clicked. Sorry, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You think that the evidence that I adduced in my opening statement would raise the probability of naturalistic pantheism as well as pantheism as, as well as theism? Yes. Okay. So, um, and and you think it would raise the probability significantly, and so these are the contending options. So I'm just curious why you're not a naturalistic pantheist. Because the argument doesn't work, it's complete nonsense from my perspective. So I would say that it's like, um, you know the principle of explosion from falsehood anything falls? The principle of explosion, I'm not familiar. Uh, it's a principle in logic with a, from if you make a false argument like saying, roses are red, therefore God exists. Well, you could just, there's, since there's no connection between those two things, we just say roses are red, therefore God does not exist. It's just because there's yeah. no connection between the and the but, but, I, but, I haven't, but I haven't made that argument. Uh, to, uh, well, right, right. So, so from my position, your argument is equally as coherent as saying roses are red, therefore God. There's no connection between anything you said and a God existing from my perspective. So I would not grant that as evidence for theism we, or pantheism. I just consider it gibberish. But we consider two things. We consider the probability of a moral reading on theism, a very generous estimate, and a generous estimate for the, pro for the probability of a the moral reading existing on atheism. And we saw that one was higher than the other. Right? Right. So I don't, so I don't first thing, I don't grant... The Bayesian epistemology cannot, in my system, in my understanding, be applied to anything that doesn't have an empirical basis. If you're applying it to things that don't have an empirical basis, it's garbage, doesn't apply. It's like saying the square root of a pork chop. Uh, but if I grant that and say, if we uh, say that we can apply Bayesian epistemology in this way, I would say that using your own system, theism is less likely than atheism because we have to take all of the numbers you put for atheism and then multiply that to make it an even smaller number for the number of possible gods. Because there could be a god that could create an ex a universe exactly like ours, or with one difference, or with two differences, or with three differences, or with four differences, of any right, possible but, variation. Well, sure. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm only claiming that the argument uh, is provides you with, with strong support for generic theism. I mean, I'm not adding well, no, ability right I'm not, here. I don't think you're following. I'm, I think, so again, yeah, yeah. any number you come up with atheism, if you have to take that number and then you have to make it smaller for theism. So the probability of theism was necessarily lower than the probability of atheism, no matter what. That's my argument. Sorry, why is that? Because there's multiple kinds of a god. So you have to take, here's the probability of this universe under theism, and then you can say, well, there's a different okay. kind of theism. The probability of well, this well, universe sure, under this you, you, you mean like there's Christian theism, and then there's Muslim, Islamic theism, and, and so forth? Is that what you mean? Well, no, because those would all create the same kind of universe. So there would be a god that could create this kind of a universe with all of the same constants and all the same probabilities of a life as you described them. And there could be a god that could create a different kind of a universe. So like a god who create a non-life permitting universe, or a god who create black hole permitting universes, or only black holes, or a god right. who creates a universe just all of suffering. And so each one of those is a possibility of theism. And so if we look at those possibilities, just arbitrarily, the probability of any one of those is one in three. The probability of a god creating a life permitting universe, a god a probability of a God created a non-life in the universe and probability of God created just an abject immoral universe. Those are three kinds of theism and just using prior probabilities of Bayesian epistemology, there's one in three, a 33% chance of all of them. And then you have to apply that to the, the universe you apply, which only can exist under the one of them. So you have to divide that number, whatever you came up with for the atheist universe, by three. Does no, I disagree. Sense? No, it doesn't, actually. Um, so, so you... Uh, you uh, so you had uh, the 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 argument was that God God has God is defined as omnipotent. So the, the argument is is for an, uh, is for a, um, an all powerful and all all good being, and because God has the ability to bring about a moral arena, and He also is perfectly good, therefore it's it's un it's not totally it wouldn't be totally unsurprising if He brought about 
a moral arena for the reasons I described in my opening statement. Um, and so even so, I, my argument doesn't even assume that the probability on theism is high. Um, it could be low for all, all the argument it cares. Uh, but the, the, on, the only pertinent point is that the probability on theism is much, much higher than it is on atheism. Okay, so you've defined a god as only being one that would create this kind of universe. You're limiting it and saying no other kind of god could ever be considered a god. By your definition, the only thing that can be considered a god is one that would potentially create well, sure, this there, kind there, of universe. There are, well, sure, there, there could be other, other gods that could create this universe. So? Or, so, so I mean, you, my, you, my, my argument is only for God. I mean, I'm, I'm not really... I'm, right, right. My argument is only Sorry. for God. So, so <laughs> by your definition of God, you have excluded all possible gods that would not create this universe. You're saying those aren't gods by definition. Correct? Um, a, a God is a... Some, it, integral to, to being a god is being maximally good. Okay, so you've world. simply defined God as a thing that would create this universe. Now, I can just do the same thing and say naturalistic pantheism has this property which is, makes it necessarily only contingent on creating this kind of a universe and make the probabilities the same. I can just say, well, okay, so the only possibility, if you're going to say that God is by definition something that would potentially create this universe, I can just say naturalistic pantheism is by definition something that would potentially create this universe and match your probabilities one for one. But the, the 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 point is that it's 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 an argument for a maximally good being. I mean, it does it doesn't uh, and 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 a very powerful being to be to have the ability to bring about such a moral arena. So it it, it I'm not arguing against you all the properties of God, and um, so I'm I, and I'm not quite sure how your naturalistic pantheism is differing from theism. And it seems that in order to have in order to to be maximally good, you would have to have some conscious mind to to be able right. to discern. Let me Yep. Okay. All right, let me clarify. So you have made up a property of all good. You've said your God has this property of all good, and having this property makes it likely that he's going to create this kind of a universe. I can just make up a different property. doesn't matter what it is. I'm just going to reject your definition of all good and say there's property X. And say this property X makes a life permitting universe likely. The universe has this property X, therefore a life permitting universe is likely. Okay, that's time. Gotcha. Thank you so much. We will now move into the closing statements which will be five minutes, and we will start with Jonathan. I have the clock set for you, Jonathan, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you um, again for a very spirited engagement. Um, uh, you'll recall my opening statement, I presented the moral arena evidence for God, um, where I argued uh, that because God is maximally good, uh, it's not at all unsurprising that he would bring about a moral arena. Um, but I went with a conservative estimate of the probability on theism at 1%. You could argue that it's lower than that, but um, I, I'm just uh, demonstrating how the um, methodology works. Um, and, I, and then I, so we evaluated the probability on theism and went with a very generous estimate, and then the probability of the moral arena existing on atheism, and we saw that even given outrageously generous assumptions, the probability for moral arena existing on theism is much, much higher than that on atheism. Um, my um, opponent this evening, um, I'm, I'm afraid to say, was, is, is very um, confused about epistemology and the nature of evidence. Uh, he doesn't, um, it's, so he, he, he thinks that having mo uh, multiple hypotheses which, ex which can explain uh, effects doesn't mean that a particular observation could be evidence uh, that raises the probability of both. Um, he um, invokes naturalistic pantheism, but his definition of naturalistic pantheism is extremely vague. Um, and insofar as it explains the data, it gets more and more like theism. Uh, and the more I ask him to give details of what he means by naturalistic pantheism, the more uh, absurd his hypothesis seems to be. He's very ill-informed, I'm afraid, on ID arguments, um, which and also information theory. Um, he claims that intelligent design is an argument from ignorance, uh, whereas, uh, as I've shown, uh, intelligent design is not an argument based on what we don't know, but the cause and effect structure of the world, but based on what we do know, namely that information is uh, uniformly and habitually associated with conscious, rational, deliberative agency or intelligent design. Um, and there are many features of biology which, which uh, seem to require a process of foresight to bring about, such as developmental biology, uh, metamorphosis, areas of the complex nanomachines in the cell, etc., etc. Um, and of course, a process evolving foresight is fundamentally indistinguishable from intelligence. Uh, so, um, he um, 
he mentioned that uh, every piece of evidence can be explained by naturalistic pantheism, uh, but uh, the n nature of the of the being that my argument supports is an all-powerful and all-good being, um, and to recognize the greatest good, it seems to me that the entity would have to have consciousness and to be able to decide between what options maximize the good um, also would require consciousness. And so it, um, his argument, his, his alternative hypothesis seems to be um, very difficult to distinguish from theism. Um, uh, and it, he wouldn't really give me much details about whether the, um, the universe he's talking about um, is has particles and laws which would which would um, lower the prior probability um, and things like that um, he um, um, he said that uh, uh, because something is unlikely in the universe does not mean the universe was designed for that uh, no one's ever no one ever claims that that's informed about these issues it's not just complexity but it's specification um, and the argument can also be framed in the Bayesian way that I give my opening statement. Um, um, he said that, uh, uh, what about the problem of priors in Bayesian uh, analysis? Priors are simply made up arbitrarily, um, and I don't think this is the case. Um, uh, sure, there are, there are cases where priors can be objectively assessed and cases where they are more subjectively assessed. Um, for the purpose of argument, I assumed a prior probability of 10 to the minus 20. Is he really going to suggest that I'm being um, self-serving in assigning a prior probability of God at 10 to the minus 20? So I, I don't I think that's a good argument. He mentioned that Richard Carrier uses Bayesian epistemology to show that Jesus never existed, and so this shows the problems with the method. Well, sure, but then people use deductive arguments to arrive at opposite conclusions. So, it's, I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. The argue, a Bayesian epistemology is only as good as the numbers you plug in. Uh, so uh, that's not a great argument either. Twenty seconds. Um, so um, yeah, in, in, I will finish with that and conclude that uh, that Tom has failed to provide a, a cogent rebuttal to the argument I presented, and thus we should affirm the proposition that I am contending for this evening, namely that God does indeed exist. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And for Tom's closing statement, I have the clock set for five minutes. So Tom, on your first word. All right, so the main argument my opponent brought today was essentially the fine-tuning argument. And the atheist position on the fine-tuning argument is we don't know what caused the fine-tuning. So essentially, the probability under atheism is it's one in whatever the possible combinations of physical laws could be. So it's one in a very big number. The theist position is we can make up an explanation that can make this more likely. Like, okay, that's nice. As an atheist, I can do the same thing. I can make up naturalistic pantheism and the laws that are intrinsic in its property, it's in its nature, can make our life bringing universe even more likely. Ah, so now I have the exact same probability or an even greater probability explanation to explain the fine tuning. So his entire argument is undermined by that simple point, which is in Bayesian epistemology known as the problem of new theories. Um, also, the fact that his he's by just defined out all of the alternative possible gods and it just made his god or his the characterization of his god the only possible kind of a god. As soon as you realize it's not, and there could be an evil god, or a god who's not all good, or a god who wants to create a black universe full of black holes, one of those probabilities just com completely crumble because you have to divide whatever probability you have for atheism by the number of possible gods, which is infinite. And so no matter what you have, you're always going to get a lower probability on theism because his definition of theism is just arbitrarily assigned to fit his god. It doesn't make any sense. As I demonstrated, the argument from design is just an argument from ignorance. Saying making it a positive argument doesn't help. You can make the argument from ignorance for lightning a positive argument. Uh, we don't know what explains lightning, therefore Zeus. Or we create sparks with an anvil. There's sparks in the sky, therefore Zeus. Still an argument from ignorance. Doesn't matter if you frame it in a positive way or a negative way. You can always make a veiled argument from ignorance by framing it in a positive way. As I demonstrated, you, anything the supernatural can explain, the unknown natural can explain, because both are unknowns. We don't, we can't limit either to be the case. So his assumption that morality requires a mind is just an assumption. He's already just defined morality in the case that is most convenient for him. His assumption that you need a mind to gain intelligence, again, just an assumption on his part where he's predefined his case to be what needs to be the case for it to show what he wants, or his conclusions. It's, it's totally arbitrary. Like, so, as I stated in my introduction, the reason science doesn't do this is because none of this implies evidence. What you need to do is 
essentially make novel testable predictions of things that are observable and falsifiable if you want to have any evidence of anything. And all he's done is make up imagined explanations of mathematics and Bayesian epistemology in order to try and come to a conclusion, which you could just do for any of the alternatives equally as well. But I would like to thank him for coming on. I did appreciate the conversation. I would like to thank Dave James for inviting us both. And it was an interesting debate. Thank you very much. Next, we will go into the Q&A, and we are going to try to move as fast as we can. We've got about 20 minutes, and I am going to start reading them off quickly. So, thanks so much for your super chat. Movie Theory says, no matter the evidence, atheists will still deny. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a little bit of trolling in the super dice, but uh, praise I am that I am said in all caps. <laughs> Sounds like praise. He said, what non-arbitrary evidential basis shows no God. Uh, I think that's, I mean, uh, well, I'll give you a chance to respond to the first one. I wasn't sure if you wanted to because it wasn't particularly targeted uh, at any of your arguments, but if you want, you can respond to both of those. So the first one, as mentioned, was no matter the evidence, atheists will still deny. If you want to respond. Sure. Uh, just, you have to make any testable prediction and I'll accept it. So if you say, I predict there is a God and I can pray to this God and get a gold brick, I will then, that's evidence of a God. I'm happy to accept that. So it's not the case. Just, I mean, if you can regrow limbs, you pray to a God, regrow a limb, record it on YouTube, that's good evidence. I mean, so no, it's not the case that we'd reject anything. We just reject things that aren't actually evidence. And what was the next one from Praise? The next one was, what non-arbitrary evidential basis shows no God? Not how I define atheism. You should probably re watch my videos and watch how I define atheism as the reason there is no reason to believe in a god, not that there is no god. Gotcha. Thanks so much for those super chats and thanks, uh, Tom, for your response. Uh, forgot to mention super chats. If you do do a super chat, you can make a comment toward one of the speakers if you would like, to which they would get to make a quick response to, and super chats automatically go to the top of the list. So, Ryan Drager, uh, thanks for your super chat. Um, says atheists are desperately trying to deny the evidence. Tom, I'm guessing that's for you. wasn't pretty. wasn't all that desperate. It seems pretty easy. Like, no, that's not evidence. Like, I don't have to desperately deny the evidence of the sun. Why can't you provide something like that? Just empirical and demonstrable. Oh, it's because there isn't any. That's why. Tom, I appreciate your response. Mr. Archaeopteryx, thanks for your super chat. He says, since we only know of one universe, which is life supporting. The probability of a life-supporting universe is one for one, or a hundred percent. I think that's for Jonathan. Uh, but the the universe could have been different. I mean, how is it one out of one? I mean, the the law. There's no reason why the laws and constants have to be the way they are. Uh, they could have been otherwise. Um, uh, yes, that's the, this is the way we observe it. But uh, um, but we still have to account for the fact that it's this way and not some other way. I mean, it's the same. I mean, I can make the same argument say we're playing poker and uh, I'm the card dealer and uh, I deal myself, um, let's say, 20 royal flushes, which is the strongest hand in poker in a row. Um, and uh, you could say, I think there's some cheating going on. There's some evidence for cheating uh, because it's, it's highly improbable that you would, uh, by chance, get... Um, that many royal flushes in a row and i could say well the probability is actually one out of one because look it happened um i mean that's not um, how we go about evaluating evidence gotcha thanks so much next up we have ashley m thanks for your super chat if you wanted to attach a question to it let me know and we can read that out for you but uh still saw the super chat and we appreciate your support so the jim tanker thanks for your super chat he says can we get some real-time fact-checking during a live debate? I know that it would not allow a theist to talk, but... It's a little bit trollish as well, so, so my guess is that's for you, Jonathan. If you, want, you don't have to respond if you don't want to. Well, I mean, I mean, just point out one factual thing I got wrong. I mean, you might dispute the structure of my argument, but I think you'll find, um, at least I'm pretty sure, there's no factual mistake in what I presented. You got it. Thanks so much. And next up, questions. Hi, Harry. Thanks so much for your question. Glad to see you. He says, for McClatchy, about the physical constraints, instead of finely tuned, could they be emergent? I.e., G is equal to related, related to curvature of space-time and momentum energy. So, um, 
I might be wrong, but where I think he's going with that is perhaps uh, the physical necessity hypothesis, um, which is to say that um, that the universe, that the laws and causes just happen to occupy the values that they do, um, it, because they, they have to out of some sort of physical necessity. There's some perhaps undiscovered law which uh, which makes uh, which constrains the the values that they can occupy. And my response to that would be that it just kicks the the fine tuning up one level um, because then you would have to explain why that um, higher law um, makes the values come out just that which happens to support life to exist in the universe. So you would just have to explain that that um, that law, that, that um, higher level um, law. Um, and, and so you just kick the fine tuning argument upstairs essentially in that. Go. Oh, can I clarify the question a little bit? So it's, yeah, yeah. you can just say there is a necessary natural law. You say, okay, so there's a law that causes the universe to be this way, and it's necessary instead of a god. Um, yeah, th then the question would be, why does that law cause the universe to turn out in a manner that is conducive to life as opposed to some other way? It's, it's necessary. So again, it's part of its nature. Um, like a part of God's nature is his moral nature. This would be a part of its nature. Um, okay, but that, that that would be a rather arbitrary law. Um, I mean, why would it be why would it be conducive to intelligent life as opposed to something else? God. Um, right. Same so, thing would apply uh, to uh, God. Uh, sorry. Well, the same thing would apply to God. Saying God has a moral nature would be equally as arbitrary. But we should probably go on with the questions. Well, I mean, I don't think it's arbitrary because God is maximally great. That's that's God is the greatest conceivable being. Um, by definition. God. God. Yeah. So I could just, by definition, pantheism is, has this property X, or this necessary natural law. Got you. So, okay, go on. So sorry, Jonathan. I know you got a response. I just want to to get through as many no. cues, uh, unless you highly, highly insist. I do have a new super okay. chat just came in. Sitchafredo uh, Sarabia, thanks for your super chat. He said, if an atheist agrees the universe created them, is it fair to ask? Quote, what created their creator? If nothing created the universe, how are they even here? So yes, that would be fair. You could say who created the creator, and I could say who created God. And just like the theist does, you can just slap the necessary label on a natural thing, like an undiscovered uh, natural pantheism or an undiscovered law of nature, just so you can say there is a necessary God. It's kind of an arbitrary property that can go to just whatever you want it to. Um, I, I, just to just to respond there to the question of who created God or who designed the designer, um, there's a few responses there. Uh, one is that in order to posit an explanation as the best, does not require you to have an explanation of that explanation. Otherwise, you would lead to an infinite regress of explanations that never explain anything. Secondly, um, you uh, God is um, every worldview has to come back to some unmoved mover, and I would contend that the best explanation or the best candidate for that unmoved mover is God, um, and because every, everything which exists exists either um, as a result of something else, i.e., it's contingent, or it exists out of the necessity of its own nature. Um, and in order to avoid the infinite regress problem, you have to eventually posit something which exists necessarily. And so a necessary being, of course, doesn't require a creator to bring it about. So it, it would be uncaused and eternal. Gotcha. And we also had a super chat that responds to uh, Sujafredo Sarabia's super chat, in which uh, the gym tanker actually says, in response to Sujafredo Sarabia, then the question, what created your God, is just as valid. So we will uh, we can go back. Stick like high five. We can go back to that one if you guys want. But next one up, Slam RN. Thanks for your question as well. Uh, she had asked, if not answered in the discussion, does Jonathan believe in biological macro evolution? Uh, it depends what you mean. Um, on uh, if you mean simply common ancestry, um, I, I'm skeptical, but I'm willing to grind up the purpose of argument. I think I think you can make a, a sensible case for common ancestry, although I think the argument is stronger at lower taxonomic levels than at higher taxonomic levels. On the, on the question of the sufficiency of uh, neo-Darwinian mechanisms, such as natural selection, random genetic mutation, genetic drift, and so forth, I think it's demonstrably inadequate to explain the complexity and diversity of life. Um, uh, I, I refer people to my recent debate with JF on the same channel where we talk about that in, in a bit more depth. Um, 
and I'm happy to do a, a, a more detailed debate on that in the future as well. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, we have... Praise I am that I am. Thanks for your question. I have a feeling this might be for Tom. He says, how does Tom not know God allowed people to choose to be born, for example, pre-existence? Well, I'm trusting that God is telling the truth in what he said in the Bible. If he's lying in the Bible, then I don't. But as long as he can't lie because of his nature, well, then he must be telling the truth about what he forced people to do without their consent in the Bible, and therefore, by his own admission, he isn't giving people consent, for example, forcing people to choose between hell or heaven and not giving them a third option. Gotcha. All right. Next up, <clears throat> J.R. Byrne, thanks for your question. J.R. asks, uh, C.S. Lewis describes Tom Jump's idea of the quote-unquote best possible world as hell. How do we determine who is right, or is it relative? Well, C.S. Lewis, if he was in my world, could just go to the Christian world. So it would be very confusing for him to call that hell if he's calling his own choice to be a Christian hell. So I'm not really sure what he's going for there, but I'm pretty sure C.S. Lewis wasn't aware of my definition of the best of all possible worlds because it didn't exist before he died. Gotcha. Okay, next up, the Craw Daddy. Thanks for your question. He says, uh, for Jonathan, removing a hypothesis from four competing hypotheses gives absolutely no credibility to the other three. Taking away three hypotheses does not make the fourth the correct one. They all need demonstrations. Oh, well, I completely disagree with that. Um, uh, I mean, that, that's just simple logic at that point. I mean, if you say, that, I mean, uh, if we said uh, four hypotheses, if you eliminate three, it doesn't provide any support for the final one. That, that's just simple logic. The premises would be uh, A, B, C, or D, not A, B, C, therefore D. That just follows as a valid syllogism. Um, as for um, his first comment, um, if you have four hypotheses and you eliminate one, that doesn't support or give credibility to the other three. Actually, it raises the probability of the remaining three because you redistribute the probabilities by eliminating a possibility. Um, and if you if you redistribute the probabilities and the probabilities of the other remaining three candidate hypotheses increase, uh, that means that you provided evidence for the remaining three. Um, just to clarify there, that's only assuming it's A, B, C, or D and there aren't any other options. Like all four Correct. could be wrong. So that's one of, I think that was more kind of the question, the what he was alluding to. Yeah, um, well, sure. I mean, um, but uh, on something like, let's say, the fine-tuning argument, the, there's three contending categories of explanation, namely chance, nece physical necessity, or design. Um, and if you can eliminate the chance hypothesis and physical necessity hypothesis, that, that, that provides very strong support for the design thesis. Um, so, yeah. We're uh, just to keep moving. Tom, I know you probably have a response, but uh, just to move as fast as we can. Uh, Sigifredos Rabia, thanks for your super chat. I, this is responding to uh, Jim, uh, the Jim Tanker. And his response, Sujurhiro Sarabia said, a god would be uncreated and not in time. So thanks for that uh, dialogue, you guys. And next up, by the way, I did not miss Dave Langer's question. I definitely got it. So thanks for that. I saw somebody. Oops, there we go. Uh, for John, since he s thinks the universe was finely tuned, does that mean God had no choice in how the universe was created? No, it doesn't mean that. I'm not sure where he's going with that. Um, gotcha. Uh, Next. So, I mean, he obviously he sees, um, I mean, he has free choice in how he brings about the universe, but because of his moral nature, he sees some value in, uh, in uh, moral creatures, sentient moral creatures, uh, and therefore he chooses to bring about that sort of universe. Um, sorry, Karen. Gotcha. Next up, Karag Nightwolf. Thanks for your question. This is for Jonathan. He asks, what is his definition of an atheist, and does he believe atheism is a worldview rather than atheists have worldviews? Um, so this is something that's contested, and there's different. There's a whole range of different opinions on there that are voiced. Usually in the academic literature, what people mean by atheism is the belief that God does not exist. However, um, recently, there's been a move away from that definition among atheists, especially um, internet atheists, towards the definition that atheism is simply a lack of belief in God um, or a failure to be persuaded of the existence of God. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to define atheism, however, my particular opponent at the time wants to define it. Um, 
uh, there, there's also a spectrum, of course, between agnosticism and atheism, and atheism and agnosticism are kind of the boundary between those is kind of blurred. What was the other part of the question? Um, the other part was regarding worldviews and is. Uh, oh yeah. Does is, it... is atheism a worldview? Um, no, I, I don't think atheism is a worldview, but atheists have worldviews. Although atheism. I mean, if you reject, if once God is out of the picture in your worldview, of course, that's going to have downstream metaphysical implications in re respect to other things in your worldview. But atheism itself is, is not a worldview. It's just it's an element of worldviews, but it's not itself a worldview. Gosh, yeah, thanks so much. Next up, J.A. Green, thanks for your question, which is for Jonathan. If God does exist, is it a theistic God or a non-theistic God? How would we be able to determine what god it is if a god does exist so i am a christian theist so obviously i think uh, there's a theistic god um and there's a number of ways you could argue for um theism as opposed to deism um one would, would be to argue for the resurrection of jesus which i've debated on, on this program before if you go check out my debate with um, um uh, what's his name uh the um president of the um Atheist Republic, um, which is also in this channel. Um, uh, uh, Jim, uh, Jim, uh, second name is escaping me. Um, I, I recommend going and checking that out, um, where we discuss the evidence for the resurrection. And uh, yeah, so I, I would argue for the evidence for the resurrection, and also um, predictive prophecy, both messianic and non messianic, in, in the Old Testament and Hebrew scriptures. Um, and uh, various other categories of evidence from things like the unity of scripture, et cetera, that point to the reality of Christian theism as opposed to just bare um, generic theism. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Next up, we have a question from Capturing Christianity. Thanks, Cameron, for your question. He asks, for Tom, there are infinitely many hypotheses that can explain any set of data. How does this reasoning not also undermine all scientific knowledge? think we might have yeah uh, i think it might yeah i was i was muted so yeah scientific testable predictions are whichever one can be first used to make the future testable predictions that one has a more likely possibility of being true than any of the others that can only post hoc explain it and since we only have one or one person comes up with one that can make predictions before anybody else that one's the best so it doesn't undermine scientific theories because there is one that is discernibly better than the others because it can be used to make future testable predictions before any of the others Gotcha. Thanks so much. And we just had a new super chat come in. This is from J.R. Byrne. And uh, forgive me if I mispronounced it. Uh, J.R. asks, he says, C.S. Lewis describes hell as getting exactly what you will. Is that different than Tom Jump's definition? Who is right? Is it relative? No, I'd be totally okay with that kind of a hell. If I get to go to my own universe and design it however I want, and that's what I will, and that's hell, I'm good with that. I'm okay with that hell. Gotcha. Next up, Subtracted, thanks for your question, or Super Chat as well, and Subtracted asks, if God is outside of space and time, how could God create something if creation is a transition, and transition is temporal? Is that for me? I think so. Did you say the question again? You bet. They ask, if God is outside of space and time, how could God create something if creation is a transition and transition is temporal? Oh, right, I see. Um, so um, so this is, a, this is an argument that William Lane Craig has made for, um, for it being a, a personal agency because um, if, you, um, if, if you have a, um, an eternal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, the effect is necessarily there. Um, but if you have, um, 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 if if you if you have the, the the cause being simultaneous with, so one way to get around this problem is to have the cause simultaneous with the effect. Um, so let me explain. If you imagine, um, uh, if you imagine a, a log that's floating in the water, um, for example, if the log's been floating there for all eternity, causing the water to be displaced, uh, there, um, if that's if that. If that's the log's been floating there for all eternity, then the effect is also eternal. Likewise, if water, if the temperature is zero degrees, then the 
then the water is frozen. If it's been frozen, if the temperature is zero degrees from all eternity, the water has been frozen from all eternity. Um, so the cause can be simultaneous with the with the with the effect um, at that point. And of of, of course the, um, the the theist will want to argue that God is. Um, is it has freedom of the will, and so he can freely choose to bring about an effect. And so uh, that's how we explain how um, God can be a necessary being and eternal, and, and so have a um, and freely bring about an effect at, at time zero. Um, so, so um, um, because otherwise, if you have an eternal set of necessary, necessary and sufficient conditions, the effect is also there from all eternity. So that's that's how theists get around that that problem. Gotcha. That makes sense. You bet. Thanks so much. Next up. Jeffrey per Paris, forgive me if I mispronounced it, uh, correct me. And this question is for both. It's, isn't it possible that there are fully explanatory naturalistic models for one, more, or all of the quote unquote layers Jonathan presented that we just haven't discovered yet? Um, well, there are there you could always you could, you could any for any scientific explanation you could say that um you could say that for the arguments for the proposition of universal common ancestry in evolutionary theory you could say well there there could be some explanations that are there are not uh, that that are not common ancestry which explain those observations that we just haven't discovered yet well sure but we have to work with what we have now and uh and so that sort of argument, I think, is a naturalism of the gaps argument, where you're just clinging on in faith that there will be an explanation in the future that we haven't discovered yet, um, when really we have to just work with what we have now and form our opinions as to the as to where the evidence points and the best explanations based on what we have available to us right now. Gotcha. Thanks so much. That was for both of us. What did you say? Ahead. You said that was for both of us. Yes. All right, so uh, yes, there could always be a natural explanation, and uh, which because there could be a natural explanation, and we only have evidence of natural things, we should always prefer the natural explanation, just like because of induction. You see a white goose, white goose, white goose, white goose. It's reasonable to infer the next goose is going to be white. So if we find something we don't know, it's always reasonable to infer it's going to be a natural explanation. So there is no such thing as naturalism of the gaps. It's just called induction. It can only be a supernaturalism of the gaps because there's no black goose yet. Gotcha. Thanks so much. And I'm really sorry. We're, we're not, I, I've got to go in, in just a bit uh, once we get to the two hour mark. It's around when I have to leave. But uh, we're going to try to speed through these last ones. So thanks for your patience. Sorry if we don't get to your question. Uh, question for Tom Jump What is the quote unquote unknown natural? Is it infinitely many hypotheses? If so, how is that not mythological naturalism? What well, it is? It's just natural things we don't know about yet. So it is, it's just essentially whatever natural things could exist that we don't know about. So it is mythicism. So it's just as mythical to say there is an unknown super law of nature that does X as it is to say that there is a God that does X. It's just totally made up. I don't actually believe in particular unknown natural things. It's just more reasonable to assume it's an unknown natural thing because we already have the natural than it is to assume there's this entirely new category of things we have no examples of, the supernatural. Gotcha. Uh, just had a super chat come in. Sidra Pedro Sarabia, thanks for your super chat. He said, Isaiah 45 7 says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And then Sidra Pedro asks, Is this denied by Christians and why? So I guess that would be for Jonathan. Um, so, uh, Isaiah 45 7, did you say? What was the reference? That's Isaiah 45, I think it was 7. Yep, 45, 7. Isaiah 45, 7. I found, um, yeah, so I, um, what, I'm not quite sure what his point is, but sure, yeah, I, I agree with that. Gotcha. Thanks so much, and thanks for, Sidra Pedro, for your super chat. Next up, Pine Creek Gas. Question for Jonathan, your old sparring partner, Jonathan. This is yeah. how <laughs> I, I remember this. Uh, John, uh, Pine Creek, I discovered through you, Jonathan, because I had seen you go on his channel, and uh, it was an interesting convo. So uh, Pine Creek asked, if there were no God, how would Jonathan define morality? If there were no God, how would I define morality? Um, I, I don't believe that mor morality can be objectively grounded apart from theism. Um, 
so I think theism, it's, I think morality itself, or objective ethical norms itself, presupposes a theistic worldview. Gotcha. So there would be no morality. You bet. Thanks so much. Liam Ayrton, thanks for your question. It's asked, if debaters are willing to cite sources before uh, hand, beforehand, then either opponents or independents could look up legitimacy, perhaps. That's a good idea, Liam. That's something we've... Uh, one of our upcoming debates, which might be, do men have male privilege? Uh, they might actually do that where they exchange sources beforehand. So that's a debate that might come up between Jared and scientist Mel in the works. Uh, so that's something we'll, I'll run that by Jonathan and Tom next time. Tyler uh, Durden, thanks for your question. They uh, asked for John, are atoms designed? If everything, including atoms, are designed, how do you distinguish design, uh, designed things from non-designed things? How do we distinguish design from non-designed things? So the argument, um, so, uh, the argument is, okay, um, to take the illustration of Paley's watchmaker, um, what if the whole, um, we recognize a watch on a heath because we can discriminate between the watch which is designed versus things which are not designed and what if we have and, and to make the the argument from nature we're asserting the whole universe is a watch and so how do we differentiate between design and non-design um because of the phenomenon of specified complexity um you consider for example the um mount, um, mount rushmore in south dakota which has the um the pres the faces of four u.s presidents chiseled onto the the cliff face um, that rock formation is designed, and yet we can we can distinguish it quite readily from things which are just the product of wind and erosion. Um, and likewise, we do this in I think biological systems that what, and the universe and nature generally. When we find that phenomenon of specified complexity, we intuitively infer it, um, design as the best explanation because specified complexity we know from experience comes from the conscious agents. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Trying to speed through. Uh, Akirez Kizaniti, correct me if I say it wrong. If everything is designed, what designed God? What designed what? Where did what come from? What is before what? We've already addressed this. Maybe move on for the Got it. sake of time. Arn Ruervik, thanks for your question. For McClatchy, if God didn't exist, would you want to know? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't want to waste my life on something that's not true. Um, so that, that's actually why I read a lot of atheist books. That's why I listen to a lot of atheist podcasts and, and do debates with atheist scholars and thinkers um, and invite atheists onto my webinar on Saturdays because I really want to know. Um, I, I really want my beliefs to be true. I, I want to, if, if Christianity wasn't true, I would want to know it. So absolutely. Um, I'm a Christian because I'm persuaded by the public evidence that Christianity is objectively true. And uh, if I wasn't persuaded by that public evidence, I wouldn't be a Christian. And if, if Christianity wasn't true, I, I would certainly want to know that rather than base my life on something that's delusional. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Uh, Rai Rez, thanks for your question. For John, if a schizophrenic says God talks to them, does John believe it? Why? And how can he know? Um, well, I would be skeptical. Um, uh, if the person has a history of mental health conditions, that might give me even more um, reason for skepticism. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and also we, we, we know of plenty of people who claim to have such experiences and suffer from mental health conditions. And so that's a plausible explanation for why people hear voices and so forth. Um, so that would be the explanation that I would favor in, in such a case. Um, that's all I'd say to that. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Epic Christ, or uh, let's see, for Tom Jump, if this natural pantheism is eternal, how can it change its state to create a universe? Unless you, unless you s states multiverse, but infinity cannot metaphysically exist. I think he was maybe... Yes, there... It's, I can just take it. Yes, there can be actual infinites. There are absolutely no paradoxes with actual infinites. It's all made up. Um, 
Mm. You can have eternal change. There's no problem with that. By eternal, you could have something that exists outside of space-time. For example, there are physics theories where there are things that exist outside of space-time, like uh, Nima or Kani Hamad's amplituhedron, Sean Carroll's emergent space-time. Uh, so there are lots of different ways to accomplish that. Um, many, there's probably infinitely many that we don't know of ways to accomplish that. So there's not really an issue there for my theory. Gotcha. Last one. Uh, forgive me. I tried to get at least one question from everybody, and the other ones where we had more than one question from those people, I saved them, but we just kind of run out of time. But uh, the general asks. How did Tom Jump become an atheist, and why does he resist Jesus Christ? Um, I became an atheist in high school. None of my prayers were ever answered. I just lost faith. The reason I resist Jesus Christ now is because all the evidence is against him. There's no evidence for the existence of a God, and the properties of a God are self-mutually exclusive. So the Christian God is definitely out, and the fact that there's, any, there's no evidence for any other kind of a God that could potentially exist. We appreciate your response, and thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. This has been a blast. If you enjoyed it, feel free to hit that thumbs up if you would like other people to see this debate as well. That helps the channel get the videos out there in the algorithm. So with that, I want to say thanks so much to our speakers. I am indebted to you guys. We really appreciate it. We know you could debate in a lot of places. So thank you guys for coming here. They are linked in the description. So if you're like, oh, man, uh, that person was sharp. I like that. Well, you can check out their stuff right below, right down there in the description, see? And with that, I want to say uh, any last words? Uh, again, just thanks so much for the, the speakers being here. We really appreciate it. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks so for much. having us on. <laughs> you betcha. So with that, take care, everybody. Keep sifting through the re... or keep sifting... What's my phrase? I forgot it. <laughs> Keep sifting. Reasonable from the unreasonable. That's right. Keep sifting the reasonable from the unreasonable. Long day. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody.